Hello, hello. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us um, to our next edition of Leading in a Crisis Virtual Summit, Actionable Business and HR Strategies for Navigating Crisis and Change. Today, I'm very honored to have with us SVP of HR of Guidance Res Residential, <laughs> Heidi Portita. Hello, Heidi. Hi, Nisa. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us, Heidi. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for, for uh, actually doing the, the Leading in a Crisis Summit. It is seriously very important for HR leaders to take advantage of during this time. And just the fact that you guys are doing this is such a blessing to many of us. Well, thank you. Um, I, I didn't pay Heidi to say that. <laughs> but it, it, honestly, it means so much to me to know that this is hopefully helping in some small way and that the work we're doing is, is hopefully meaningful and making a difference. So thank you. Uh, our talk today is an HR discussion panel. It's COVID-19's impact and HR's priorities, real lessons from HR leaders. And that's why we have invited Heidi uh, to join us today. And so just to move quickly, I want to say thank you to our sponsors, the Whitmarsh Consulting Group, without David and his team of super talented multi-channel marketing experts, our summit would not be possible. Um, if your organization is pivoting from where you were to some new place, um, reach out to David. Um, they do a marketing plan analysis, uh, complimentary, and their team is um, super resourceful at creating great marketing strategies and implementing those strategies. Um, I also want to say thank you to Insperity HR that makes a difference. Um, Insperity not only sponsored our webinar series, but they also put together a freebie for our HR friends. Um, if your HR budget is gone the way of the dodo bird, um, then I would highly recommend you reach out to our friends over at Insperity at turnkeycoachingsolutions.net forward slash HR report. They have put together a free HR financial analysis report and debrief. What that looks like is comparing your current budget or the budget you need to do um, against best practices and what other organizations are doing and offering you some support and ways in which you can make the most of your budget given this difficult time. I um, also want to say thank you to our internal team of strategists who have put together a data-driven strategic planning process specific and unique to the pivot that so many of us in business are having to do. Um, if you're curious about that, give me a call. I can share a little bit of the details and we can kind of assess what kind of action plan may be a good fit for you and your team. A little bit about me. Um, my name is Anissa Avon, and I am the founder and CEO of Turnkey Coaching and Development Solutions. Um, we are a single source provider for learning and development, organizational development, and management consulting. Um, and when I reached out to my team and said, okay, life as we know it has just changed, um, what can we do to make a difference during this time? We have 50 plus experts that have volunteered their time um, on topics uh, ranging from like what we're doing today with Heidi and HR panel, what's working, what's not from the trenches, um, all the way to managing a newly remote workforce to getting them back <laughs> into the office to financial management and strategic thinking around this whole piece. Um, so, Check back on our Leading in Crisis um, Summit page. We're adding new talks all the, all the time, all the way through the end of June now. So um, super excited to introduce you to Heidi Partita. Um, Heidi um, is the SVP of Human Resources at Guidance Residential. She's worked in HR um, within the financial services industry, specifically wholesale and retail mortgage lending. Um, I wrote down 15 plus, but I just understood that it's 17 plus years. And in fact, in the middle of that, she actually went back and got her MBA. Uh, is, that, is that right? Your MBA from Ashburn? That's correct. Yeah. That's okay. correct. 
I thought I saw that. So um, Heidi's experience ranges from all aspects of HR. We're talking organizational design and compensation and staffing and benefits administration and um, budgeting and, you know, you name it. Um, she has been a part of it and led the charge on it. So I am going to stop showing my screen and I'd love for you to share a little bit about you and then let's start talking about the things you guys are doing over there that are working and what's not working. Okay. Well, thank you, Anissa. I'm so honored to be here and thank you to everyone who's joining us. Um, I work for Guidance Residential. We are a residential mortgage lender. Our corporate office is based here in the uh, Washington, D.C. metro area. And I oversee the HR uh, strategy for the organization. It is a nationwide organization. We have 18 offices nationwide, but our corporate office is here in Reston, Virginia. Um, I oversee the compensation design, salary banding, benefits, recruiting, um, talent management, succession planning. I also oversee payroll and commissions. And uh, because we were such a small company when I joined and grew very quickly, over the last five years, I still also and my team oversee the facilities management for all of the offices nationwide. Oh my God. Um, you guys are in yes. 30 states, I think. Yes, we are in 30 plus states, correct. <laughs> and we, we have employees in, I think, about 20 of those now. Wow. Yes. Wow, congratulations. And, and I know that you guys grew really, really fast. Um, and I, I also know that from our conversations, um, somehow you were, frankly, more prepared for this crisis than a lot of organizations that we've been working with. Would you, would you share a little bit about, you know, the things that you did, you guys were prepared and how did you do that, you know, not knowing that what was about to hit us? Yeah, sure. Um... You know, I don't, I don't think any, anyone is ever really totally prepared for something like this. Um, it, what we found, we had already done a lot of preparation ahead of time, and we had done a lot of the right things over the last few years to be able to go digital in less than one day across the nation. Um, we were just really blessed. We have such a great CEO. He's such a forward thinker. And... Um, we had already been transitioning people to go remote in our operations engine, the processing and underwriting engine, for actually a few years now. Uh, and that started about three years ago when we had two of our top people, top producers they, and inside the organization. They one day came to us with a resignation and said, we're, we're moving out of state. And we had to figure out how to keep these people. Wow. And so we got busy with our IT team to uh, do a, another type of remote work. We had VPN connections, and we, it was more of an experiment with them and being able to do that. And that successfully, about two years ago, we started looking to grow even bigger and maybe double our size. And we didn't necessarily want to take down additional office space to be able to do that. So we decided to start having people move to remote and developing the remote work policies, uh, the infrastructure behind it to support that. And, um, you know, we did that for various reasons. Um, people's preference, they had commute distances that we wanted to alleviate some of that stress. Um, some had other, needed more flexible working hours, and we wanted to keep those people because they were the right people for the organization. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and with all the different offices nationwide, we had some people already working in their home in places where we didn't need a brick and mortar and in other places where the regulations required us to have a branch office. Um, the, those people had desktops or, you know, we would already transitioned to uh, cloud-based systems across the company. There, there was a lot of, of good activity that had been done ahead of time that we were really blessed to yeah. have in place already. Yeah. I, I, you know, and it, talk about a silver lining for having to jump through all of those hoops back then that really prepared you, as you said, to, to go remote one single day. 
single day, let's do this. Pretty, pretty outstanding. Yeah. You know, can you share with us when you guys made the decision, okay, we're going to have to all go remote. It's we're, it's on, we're on, we've got till tomorrow or whatever it is on lockdown. How did you and your peer group, your executives make the decision and, and, and what all, the, what are all the decisions you had to make very, very quickly and how did you do it? Well, you know, there were a lot of, a lot of things. I mean, it, it really starts with trust. We, we're an organization that collaborates, uh, the executives collaborate on a lot of different things together. Um, we, you know, some, we had to ask, who in the organization was already remote capable um, and all the rest of them, how do we force that overnight? And, and, you know, just, I was really more of the problem solver in it. I, we had uh, the chief information officer and the chief credit officer that, you know, and, and I, we kind of broke up the organization into pieces and said, okay, you take this, you take this, you take this group of people. And we went to the frontline managers to, understand more about the equipment that their people had. Were they remote capable? Were they set up on VPN? Could they be set up differently? We, oh, by the way, we have a new employee starting on that Monday. So all these questions came up and how do we train that person? We already had that infrastructure in place with our LMS, but how do they get their equipment? How do they get all of their credentials? Um, you know, the, the directive came down at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on that Thursday, March 12th, and that everyone would need to be remote the next business morning. So we had, you know, three normal business hours to get this done. And, um, but we had already, the, the three of us, the chief credit officer, the chief information officer, and I had already been working on um, communication to the employees just in case. We didn't know it was going to happen that day. But we had a feeling that it was going to happen uh, within the next week, week and a half. And so we wanted to have that information ready. We wanted to know who needed immediate assistance. Did people have equipment? Didn't they? Um, and again, some sales were people were already remote, and the ones that were in branch offices uh, actually took their desktops home with them and their monitors. And, and that's okay, yeah. right? Um, and... Uh, thankfully, the regulators who require uh, those people in certain states like New York and, and other states that are required to have a brick-and-mortar office, even with commuting distance requirements, they temporarily relaxed those so that people could work from their homes. Well, fortunately, they did. But all of this happened within, you know, a day, three hours. Um, did you and your team just decide, okay, we're going to be pulling the, you know, burning the midnight oil because we're not going to get this done unless we do. And then divide and conquer is what I wrote down. You, you helped your managers and frontline folks um, make some decisions of their own. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes. Um, they understand their work processes better and we had to reinvent certain processes on the fly. Um, a few of our departments still deal with physical paper. Um, our post-closing department still gets physical signed packages in from customers. They have to process that. They have to sell that to the investors. They have to have hard ink signatures, notarizations. Everything that that department did was physical paper, and they had to be in the office because those documents are not allowed to be outside of the office for regulatory reasons. So we had to think about, um, okay, how do we change our process workflow immediately to be able to go remote? And the only people who were, um, I guess, qualified enough from an intellectual level as to what really goes on in that department were the frontline managers, the closing department, the post-closing department. So we went straight to the frontline managers and said, okay, what do you need? Who is not set up? Who is set up? Who has their own computer? Um, how are you going to handle this? What if FedEx stops running? Um, how are we going to handle the physical signatures? Who needs to be in the office and who doesn't? So we do have a handful of people that are in the office on any one given day and um, to be able to handle that. We, the finance department still gets in physical checks and sometimes physical mail and our, um, one of our affiliates 
also still gets physical mail. So we're, you know, all of a sudden we're scanning the mail. Yeah. And that, yeah. So um, a, a question came up about that, that the, the home setup. Um, and uh, I have another question about your process. So let me go to the question. It says, how do you deal with reimbursement for their home setup? You know, we don't, we haven't necessarily reimbursed. Um, people can take that as an unreimbursed business expense. Some people, what we've done is we've allowed them to take company equipment home. And that way, if they didn't have it or they had just started, like we even did hiring in the middle of this. And I brought one of, just in case we didn't have a monitor, an extra monitor at the office that we could lend her. I, I was going to bring my extra monitor. We ended up, we had one at the office that we could give her. Um, but that, that's how we handled it. If they didn't have it already or they weren't able to get it, if we didn't have anyone ask for reimbursement. I, and if, if they had, we would have given, given them the company equipment to take home and borrow. Okay. You know, as you're describing this, I, I have to say the, the agile way in which you guys manage this, the, the nimbleness of quick decisions. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what was your, how did, you get where I'm going with this. this is unusual for an organization to be able to move that quickly. These, some of these were big decisions and some other organizations perhaps would get really mired in the rumination of, do we let them take the equipment home? What if we don't ever get that back? What about the, you know, the rec So you get where I'm going this. How did you guys set yourselves up for success that way? Well, I think, I think I said before, it starts with trust. You know, we have to have the right people on staff. And sometimes we also have to make the quick decision that do we lose a $100 monitor? Is that worth losing an employee that's of much greater value, number one? Number two, if they're not able to do their work at home productively, there are, um, you know, it, we want to make sure that they do that. And it it wasn't about the equipment as much as it was if they can't be productive, how much more is that going to cost us? Mm -hmm. So in, in part of your culture, and, and this is a question, but I'm going to have to make a statement about it in order to get this question out. So is it accurate that part of your culture is, um, is built on trusting your teammates? Absolutely. Absolutely. If we can't trust each other, we can't work and solve problems quickly. And part of getting this done was work, solve problems quickly. Did you guys also then empower your frontline managers with, you have the authority, you have some decision-making power here, help your team get it done? Or did you have edicts that said, this is the way we're going to do it, you guys fulfill this? No, um, we actually gave the frontline managers the authority to modify their work processes, and they're still modifying them constantly. They found, especially in um, the post-closing department, they found that what only one person in the office on any given day wasn't going to work. So we had to pair different people up with each other who would complement each other's strengths to be able to get the workload done. Um, the mortgage industry has extremely high volume right now. And to be able to have the people at home be able to work productively, they, we needed to allow them the flexibility to do that. Wow. Now, was that something that was new to these managers, um, being emboldened with authority and decision-making power, or is that also part of your general culture? It is part of our general culture because they're on the front lines. They know better than we do uh, what their team members are challenged with on a workflow basis. Now, the overall workflow is, is uh, really decided and, and collaborate. I mean, it's a very collaborative culture. If there are things that don't work, we'll, we'll look at that and redo it. But in this situation, the, um, the employees had to be empowered to even 
manage from the front line to the front line managers to tell them, hey, this, this still isn't working. What about this? What about this? So we're seeing a lot of that on a, on a day-to-day basis. And they're bringing in the ideas um, and making decisions. And then you guys are collaborating on problem solving. Yes. Okay. Um, We did have some folks um, email in some questions. So I want to read a couple of these. Um, Yeah, this one is, uh, as employees start to come back into the office and the safe reopening rules are in place, social distancing, wearing masks, um, one one client observed that there are philosophies on both extremes, those that want to follow the strictest guidelines and those that want things back pre-COVID. Employee one um, that was wearing their mask all day was sitting near employee two that did not want to wear their mask most of the day. Employee one has now contacted HR and stated that they would not come back to work unless they were assured that all employees in the work area would adhere to the new rules. And the, the, the question beyond that is how do we handle this from a supervisory perspective, a CEO perspective, an employee slash peer perspective? Yes, we, we definitely want our people to feel safe. Um, there are a lot of guidelines that are out there are just really wanting to make sure that we offer a safe environment and in, in our group, we find that people are very respectful of each other, and that's not always the case out there in, in, the, in, in the marketplace. But we, you know, there are things that, that we can do to help those people feel safe. First of all, they, they have to be heard. We have to understand what their concerns are. And... In our company, it's, and when we have that kind of a situation, what we're going to do is, if they're productive from home, if they're able to be productive from home, they're welcome to still work from home. Okay. Okay. And, and if they're not, you know, let's say it's one of those, the, the, the folks that's just easier, if folks are in the, that mail room, for example, um, you know, doing some of the paper piece that, it has to be done. What will guidance residential's policy be when folks are more elbow to elbow like that? I'm sorry, would you be able to repeat that question? Yeah, yeah. So what happens when, what about the folks who aren't able to be productive at home for whatever reason, the job itself, or um, it's really just better that they're at the office and two employees are elbow to elbow, one is willing to follow social distancing, the other is not. What, what's your take on how someone might handle that? Well, if, if the employee isn't willing to follow the social distancing guidelines, then that, that would be a separate issue because that would be a policy and, that, and that's required, right? We don't really allow people to be elbow to elbow. Yeah, yeah. And so it, it comes down to what, and this is, I'm, I'm verifying, it comes down to policy. You know, when you guys are back in the office and if social distancing is still required, you're going to have policies and everyone will be expected to follow those policies. Or as you said, if they can work from home and be productive, you guys are also going to be flexible. That's okay. Absolutely. Okay. So in answer to to his question, um, Tom's question, it really is about insisting that the policy be followed. So if it's, um, or letting them work from home, you know, if that's a possibility. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I have another question for you. Uh, Let's see. Our executive director had us return to the office on May 18th. Some of our staff are openly rebelling as they feel it isn't safe to return despite the many actions we are taking to make the workplace safe and the communication um, to those employees. My question is, are other companies experiencing this and how are they responding to those employees? We are actually still remote through June 10th. Um, We, since we are fully productive right now, we're 
making sure that our people are safe. And if if people are not um, able to be productive or are rebelling from coming into the office, in our situation, we will allow those people to work from home. And if they are productive at home, I think this goes back to the last question. Yeah. If, if they're productive at home, then that's great. That's absolutely fine. They don't have to come into the office. But if they can't be productive at home and they won't come into the office, we want to pay people to work wherever they work. And if they can't work or won't work, then we're, we're going to have to have a different conversation. I think that's very helpful. Um, it's um, what I'm hearing is it is about flexibility. It is about making sure that they feel safe. It is about having policies that ensure a certain standard across the organization. And we're still have we still have to be productive. And we still have to work. It, it, there's no pass on whether or not you get to ha get your work done because of this. Correct. Yeah. Correct. I mean, we're, we're paying you to do a job. Correct. And and getting that job done, whether it's in the office or at home productively, that, that's what we're paying for. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. A, a couple of comments have come in. Um, I think this is related to California law. We've had several folks um, say this, but um, in so certain states, many requ may require a company regardless um, to be reimbursed. Um, and then someone else wrote something similar. If they're using their internet, Wi-Fi, any of that, reimbursement for California, um, Labor Code 2802 under wages an hour covers it. Um, so they actually don't, they, there's, evidently they're supposed to get a reimbursement without a request. So I wanted to read that for the other folks on the call. A um, Couple of other things I'm, I'm curious about, Heidi. Actually, my first question is, is, If you could look at some of the things you've done, you know, the top one or two things that, you've, that you guys have done really, really well, and if you had to sum up, okay, if I had to choose one or two things, and if we just only did those things well, these are the things that I would say everyone should know or do. What, what's that? Oh, one of the top two or three. We may have already covered some of them, but um, you know, a lot of it was being flexible in uh, the channels of communication and making sure that we empowered the frontline people to know how to do their jobs the best way and listening and making sure that that was within policy. Um, problem solving on the fly and trust. And again, it comes, it comes back to trust. Yeah. Team, working with team members that you can trust Hiring the right people, um, the infrastructure is, yeah, is, is extremely important. You know, a lot of the things that you're sharing with us are because you guys had some, some solid practices, processes, infrastructure prior. Um, it, it, in looking at the things that have transpired, whether it be communication or getting the workflow done or meetings, where were the areas that you guys had to adapt after the fact? Oh, um, you know, I, the regularly scheduled meetings were happening. Some of the adaptations after the fact were um, just, you know, the, the equipment. We found that we didn't, somehow think about some things like, um, you know, the company credit card is used and it was usually on a physical card because no one's supposed to have it written down and use it without authorization. How do we handle that? We forgot about that. Um, how, uh, uh, there was another one about the, uh, how do we make sure that people rotate, who rotates. Oh, we forgot about asset management when these, when this equipment walked out the door. Right. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, who took what? Right. And, but, but that was not as important as making sure our people were able to do their jobs either. Yeah. And so we were able to put that back together within a day and get that documented. And yes. So, so even though the dog wasn't, yeah, go ahead. No, 
those are some of the, the smaller things that we that we found and and some we found that some people are just not effective in a remote capacity yeah so we, we did have a few issues with that let's talk a little bit about that um how did you go about evaluating a person's remote effectiveness and then explaining the expectations and then shifting somehow. I mean, tell us about, about that. Yes. Um, some of the departments that were not already remote and, and remote capable or had policies surrounding remote work, um, Everyone, you can, we have daily reports that tell us, because we're a production environment, we have daily reports that tell us what gets done by whom, how many decisions the underwriters make, how many, um, how many files the post-closers have done in that day. And it, we, look, we can look, look at the reports and run them daily. And communication with managers, communication among team members, so we, we can tell if people are productive. And when customers, you know, have issues reaching an, an account manager or a salesperson, we usually hear about it. So what did you do? You know, because my, my assumption is that there were some folks who were hyper productive in the office and then they got home and now they're homes having to homeschool their kids and, you know, share some of the resources. And, you know, some folks are working in their closets or in their car because the house is crazy. You know, how do you manage evaluating who's not productive because there's extenuating circumstances and who's not productive because they really are sunning at the pool? Yes. Um, you know, the people who have extenuating circumstances, uh, we had a few, and they were able to work through those challenges. And as, as long as people get their work done in a given day, we're very flexible when it comes to if, if you have to uh, take two hours off in the middle of the afternoon because your parents need you to get supplies for them, or you and your husband are on a rotating schedule for the children and the school homeschooling now of the children. And some of our people, you know, have aging parents and the children now at the same time in the same house. So we, we had to be flexible as far as what our quote unquote normal work hours, you know, that, that was one of the very early on misconceptions and it didn't last for more than an hour when, you know, yeah. Expecting people to be, you know, available during normal work hours. And it really all boiled down to communication. So people would say, you know, someone on my team said, hey, you know what, I'm going to be offline for a couple hours. I need to do something with my parents. I'll be back online at this time. Fine. You know, we, we've built such a, uh, a culture of communication and trust, but that's okay. I, I, don't, I don't know if that's, um, you know, something that's, unusual maybe it is but that's the kind of organization that we wanted to create and it started with hiring the right people now other people that were not able to be productive at home what we found both on the management side and the employee side was that this situation magnified both strengths and weaknesses at the same time and we we found that the people who really were not productive at home because they were at the pool and they just weren't getting their work done, we could look back and say, yeah, they were already struggling in the office too. Okay. It just magnified the problem. That's a, a really interesting, I'm not surprised, but it, it clarifies an appropriate response to that as opposed to were they a productive in the office and something is occurring? Um, it, am I hearing that right? Yes, yes, you are. So Heidi, one thing though that I'm, I'm curious about related to those, the supervisors, you know, oftentimes um, the team at the top, if in fact this is the culture and the values that they're holding, it doesn't always get articulated to behaviors in our supervisors. Supervisors, you know, also know they're responsible for performance. And if their team isn't performing, 
they're going to have a certain style about how they're going to expect those people to perform. Help me connect the dots between what you're saying to the supervisors, to their people. How did you get those dominoes to line up? Because frankly, that is kind of unusual. <laughs> I don't know if you realize it. <laughs> well, we have really high standards. We work hard and we play hard. Um, and there, it, again, it all goes back to the collaborative environment. We do hold high standards for our team, and we communicate when expectations are not met. We want to make sure that people know what's expected of them. And when things don't happen, we try to find out why and set clear expectations of, okay, this is what we expect, and we want to help you get there. And those dialogues go on all the time, in the office or outside of the office. And okay, so how did you get that? Are you training your managers and your frontline folks on performance management and feedback? Is that part of the internal organizational development plans? Yes. Okay. Yes. We, we don't do your standard performance reviews. It's ongoing feedback and ongoing evaluation and ongoing communication and feedback. We want to make sure that our people know on a regular basis how they're doing and that we value them. And if there's something that is preventing them from being able to be as productive as, as they can be, as, as we believe that they can be, because they have the ability and, and they're able to do that, we've seen them be able to do that, <clears throat> what's going on, how can we help you and how can we support you? Do you need uh, time management? Do you need uh, training? Do you do you need a system? Do you need a system to follow? And we'll help you. We'll share best practices among the teams, among the various groups. And yeah. And, and are you guys using um, a technology to have that kind of two-way dialogue? No. Just set up no, not the really. It's okay. in person, on the phone, in email, usually on the phone. Yes. Wow. Well, that's working. It's working. So I do have a couple of questions about um, some of the challenges. Um, you know, looking back from the beginning to where you are now, um, what are a couple of the challenges that you, that you guys had to overcome and perhaps had to make a bigger decision about? Um, I don't, I don't know that, um, there are a whole lot more than we haven't already covered. Yeah. I mean, you know, some of the, the biggest challenges were the equipment. Did people have the equipment? They're welcome to take it home. Um, and yes, and the, the productivity. Um, yeah, I guess one of the later challenges and ongoing challenges was how do we keep a positive uh, attitude in the organization because there's there's so much when when you read and, and look at the news and look at what's going on around <clears throat> excuse me and and hear things on social media um, it's really easy especially for people out there if they feel disconnected to go into a whole different mindset and really understanding up front the importance of uh, uh, all, you know, all company communication and having the CEO send out the messages. I would send out messages. Um, our marketing team would also send out messages. Um, we collaborate um, with the, uh, like, virtual happy hours without the beverages, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, with my team, I do a happy half hour. We call it H cubed, you know, once a week. And, and Zoom meetings, we have a, a digital lounge where people go and they interact with each other. And really looking at um, working with the people, understanding and just how are you doing? And, and that goes a really, really long way. You know, how do you... How did you know for, let's take the digital lounge, for example. I mean, did you guys go remote and go, Hey, we're going to have a digital lounge. Or did you realize, Ooh, we're kind of disconnected. What can we do? How, how did that happen? Yes. Um, that was already in the works. Um, 
for a couple months before this happened. And um, we, we looked at, okay, how do we collaborate more effectively across the nation versus just here at corporate? And how do we engage um, the different teams, the different functions across the nation, the sales and the operations, into you know, more of a group communication and developing the policies around that and having it be more collaborative. I, it, I don't know that that was lucky. I, I know that it was a need that was seen ahead of time and it really has made communicating with the employees much, much easier and engaging them. Well, so let's talk a little bit about this collaboration piece. Um, do you guys uh, use any tools to support a, a collaborative approach or people, you know, bringing forth their ideas? Um, how, what's your process for encouraging the culture to collaborate? Um, yeah, well, we encourage it, but we also expect it. You know, we, we have, we have cross-cultural, cross well, we're also a very diverse group. And, um, but we have cross-functional team collaboration on all kinds of company issues. Um, when, like, for example, uh, customer service or, um, you know, how do, we, how do we launch this? Who do we need to talk to if we want to um, automate something? And what other groups are impacted by that? So we pull different department heads together to collaborate all the time. It's not just on the digital lounge, it's on everything. So you guys are- I don't making, know if that answers your question. It, it does. But it, it's something you expect. It, it's what you expect. And then talk me through the logistics of that. Um, some folks, you know, would say, oh, we're collaborating on everything. It's one meeting after another, but then there's no follow-up after that to, that's an actionable strategy to you guys have you guys implemented a collaboration process or technology or systems that actually help you move the actionable item down the field in a way that is um, effective for y'all? Um, yeah, the, we don't just have meetings that nothing gets done. Um, we, we have recurring meetings. It's not just one meeting on how do we solve this issue. It's a group that comes together on a regular basis and talks through ongoing challenges and how to make things better. And that's across um, the company. So are we talking about various units and, and different um, levels of employees? Tell us about that. Yes, <clears throat> yes, it, it is. Um, most of the time it's department heads, but then it's also those department heads going into, you know, having their team meetings on a regular basis and then providing feedback when they come back. Okay. Okay, so it's an intentional process. Um, yeah. I wrote down a couple of other questions. So folks that are on the call with us, feel free to uh, ask another question. Uh, ask questions in the chat box. Heidi, what have, what have I missed? What have I not asked that would be helpful for folks to understand about, you know, what you guys have done really well and, and that you would recommend other people do? Um. I think, I think especially for HR leaders during this time, it, since that I think is who we're speaking to. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I think the important thing to remember is that we have a, a responsibility, but we also have the opportunity, more so, to uh, set the tone in the organization, and you know. It, this, like I said earlier, this magnified strengths and weaknesses, it, it put a spotlight on every type of foundation crack, if there was one, or every strength. And for us as leaders, we usually are on the front lines, and we, he, we, if we have the connections, the deep connections in the organization, obviously on a healthy level, those personal connections with our people, we can easily feel the heaviness of what we help our people through 
on a regular basis. We don't feel it to the to the extent that they do, but we feel a little bit of it. And because it, you put that across 200 people, 170 people, and it can become pretty heavy if yeah. if we don't have a strategy personally as an HR leader to recharge. And that that is something that is that I think that we've done well, but I, I, I guess identified early on that I was not going to be a voice of fear in the organization. I was going to be a voice of calm and finding strategies to be able to do that was very important. Would you share some of those strategies? And, and particularly, I, I'd like for you um, to, to also share with us how you're you know, taking care of yourself during this. There's not a single... HRVP amongst us that isn't feeling the pressure of give, give, giving, support, support, supporting, and at some point, our own, your bank account's going to go dry. So strategies that you found to be the voice of calm as well as to take care of yourself in the middle of this. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, with what I do, I, this, this was very personal to me because what I do and, and the value that I need to bring to the organization from a professional level, I have to read industry news. I have to read a lot of different things and, and under, understand how those things affect the company. Now, when everything you go to online is, is shock and awe and, and sometimes tragedy, that wears into you as well, too. Yeah. So I had to intentionally seek out good news outlets to be able to um, speak more positive in um, your panel and all of, all of what your, you and your colleagues are doing has been a great help. And um, really looking at what are the facts versus what is um, going around social media. So when the governors issued safer at home orders, understanding when people say, oh, my gosh, are, are we essential and are, are we going to close, you know, reading the laws and understanding what essential sectors are and what they're not and what, what the orders really say and being able to communicate that um, and understanding that, like, for me personally, the way I recharge I exercise. I have a great deck outside with a forest that backs, you know, in, up to my house. And we have a lot of wildlife out there. So that is very calming to me. Um, I have a great, great support system at home. You know, I, my family has been amazing. And, um, you know, it, it really understanding that I don't know, for me too, I read, I, I, I'm a pianist, so I play the piano, that relaxes me. And it, it had to be an intentional time, right? Okay, I, I have to take two hours for myself. I'm going to do a couple miles on the treadmill, and then, you know, I'm going to go outside and sit on the deck for a little bit, and then, you know, let me come in and play for a half hour, and then I'm fine. Yeah. So... So I, I want to sort of accentuate what you just said. It was an intentional time for Heidi. And I think many folks need to hear that because, including myself, <laughs> and because uh, knowing that we need self-care and actually being intentional enough to time block it. These are my two hours. Um, and what am I going to do with those two hours besides veg um, that will actually recharge? And sometimes we all need a good veg, but that will actually recharge. So I think that's very meaningful um, and helpful. I want to uh, read a question that's come in. Our organization will have a new CEO joining our team. Oh my gosh. On June 1st, <laughs> the entire staff are to return to the office to work on June 1st also. However, we have several staff members that are reluctant. What is the best practice um, with a new CEO coming in? Hmm. That, that's a great question. Um, the, I, I, I'm blessed to work for a great CEO. Um, who really, really cares about his people. I, 
I would, if this is coming from uh, an HR professional that really wants to make a difference and you have a CEO that's willing to listen, um, what I would recommend is read everything that you can find on going back to work plans. Um, there are so many out there. Sherm has some great resources, uh, FEMA, CDC, and I would recommend, I mean, June 1st is, you know, 12 days away, right? So um, really look at putting a policy in place and, and getting collaboration with the CEO on that collaboration, uh, on, on that policy and, and getting that understanding what to do. I know what we would do. Um, uh, staff members that are reluctant to come back in the office if they're productive at home, that, that's fine. Please be safe. We, we want you to be well, both um, uh, professionally, personally, and productive at the same time. Yeah. I don't know if that answers the, I, I hope that answers the question. I think it does. Um... Dave writes, I, I always said, if you don't take care of yourself, how can you take care of others? Work-life balance is not necessarily taking a day off. It is taking time for your, yourself for wellness. Her examples of how to have those moments are great. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. You're uh, right, because the work-life balance right now, I think for a lot of people is, is so different than it was before. Yes. You know? I think that I think that is an accurate statement. Um, here's another question, um, and we have just do you have just a few more minutes, Heidi? Okay. Okay. Um, since COVID nineteen may come back, uh, what are strategies for getting employees involved in planning for the future? Getting constructive feedback and and ideas from employees that can be implemented may help get their buy in and cooperation. So, what are some ideas for getting those employees involved in planning for the future? Well, there, you know, we, we do regular surveys with our employees anyway um, on a lot of different things, but, you know, really getting their buy-in and involves having, going to the source. I mean, I interact personally with a lot of our employees. Um, the chief credit officer interacts with one-on-one you know, -on -one with a lot of the employees. The department managers would, I think, be a great resource as well. And understanding, okay, where are people at? Um, when this comes back, we know, and if it comes back, how, we don't know how it's going to come back. But we learned a few things here, you know, during, during this and moving to the remote. We know that we can do this again. We know what's a, a strength in communication. We know that we probably need to do a lot more of it and a lot more regularly to continue to keep people engaged. Um, but yes, we, we want their voice. We, we want to know what they think. And um, just, again, surveys would be a great strategy. Uh, personal emails, to, uh, picking up the phone to call people one a day, well, it would have to be more than one a day to go through, you know, 170, 175 people. Yes. Um, but it, let's say I were to take two weeks to go through the whole organization, you call 10 to 15 people a day, and um, or send a few people an email that I don't normally talk to and that might get scared if they see a phone call coming in from me, right? Right. Um, but I don't know why they would. They've all met me. <laughs> but you never know. If there's someone I don't, you know, I, that I don't talk to on a regular basis, they may be like, oh, my gosh, am I in trouble? Yeah. No. I'm just going to see in how you are. <laughs> well, and I think that that, you know, leaves us with some, some really solid takeaways. And I want to, you know, recap a few things that I wrote down. And, and one of which, you know, just starting with self-care. You know, if you're going to be strong for your team, you've also got to really take care of yourself. Um, uh, the divide and conquer piece, um, you know, you guys were not just, here's all the decisions. Now you guys, you know, we're handing it down. Here's the edict. Make sure you check the boxes. You have empowered over a, a period of time, if not years, of developing a culture of trust, empowerment, um, 
in enabling your managers and I'm assuming other team members to make decisions and trust one another. And that, from what I'm gathering, helped make the transition to working from home and to figuring out what we're going to do from here. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, easy is not the right word, but more smooth, uh, more deliberate, more uh, faster at being productive than, than perhaps many organizations have experienced. Yes, I, I would think so. I mean, you know, it, it, not, none of this is easy for anybody. Um, and I hope I'm not, you know, showing that it was somehow easy for us. We were blessed to have done a lot of the right things over time that made it easier than it could have been. You know what question I missed, and we may not have time for it, but I would like for you to speak to one thing. You mentioned through at least two or three times, hire the right people. And I could tell by how passionate you were when you said that, that that's part of HR's responsibility and mission. Would you give us a, you know, 30 second, one minute, you know, what do you mean by hire the right people? Do you have processes in place to make sure that happens? Uh, we do, actually. Um, uh, I sometimes call it profiling, but that sometimes has a negative connotation. I, I always use the story of the horse that my father bought me when, uh, for my ninth birthday. It was a thoroughbred, and he was a magnificent creature. He wanted nothing to do with me because he knew that I didn't know what to do with him. Okay? My father could ride him just fine. But I had to learn on what was considered to be a pasture horse, okay? So the thoroughbreds, who are they? They're smart. They're hungry. They're intelligent. They're honest. Um, they, they, they have a very high standard that they hold for themselves. And so those are the kinds of people that we look for. Now, in looking for those people, we need to make sure that the leaders are also thoroughbreds or have been trained to be thoroughbreds. Um, choosing the right people is extremely important. We can't, you know, there are a lot of things that we can teach people, but uh, we can't teach a pasture horse who wants to just wander around the pasture how to be a thoroughbred. And we can't have um, thoroughbred staff without having thoroughbred leaders because that's the, the staff members will know that if they have a weak leader and it, it never works out. Yeah. Yeah. That's a true statement. Um, do you guys use hiring assessments to determine? Uh, it? Uh, we do sometimes. Uh, yes. Especially on the sales side. Um, mm -hmm. And, and we can, you know, we, we do have access to those. Um, a lot of it, we've gotten really good at it. Uh, on, on the inside, knowing what things to look for, what red flags to look for. We, any, anytime one of those red flags comes up, we just, even if we're on the fence, we'd rather not because every time we've gone against that on the fence, we've been sorry afterwards. Trusting the process, trusting the red flags. Um, you have a favorite hiring assessment that you guys use? Um, <clears throat> I would say critical thinking skills mm -hmm. is really good. Mm -hmm. I can see that being important in your industry. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, Heidi, this has been um, really, really helpful. I, I just don't know that words can adequately describe how grateful I am and thankful that you spent your time with us and um, allowed us to have this conversation. It, it, I know that it, it's been helpful. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Anissa. It's been an honor. And everyone on the call, thank you so much for joining us. And Heidi, um, stay safe and healthy. Oh, thank you. You too. Okay. Bye, everyone. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.